Here's my top seven learning lessons for 2022 and how I plan to use them to make over $50 million in 2023. So first of all, 2022 was not a huge year of growth for us, but it was a great year in development, which brings me to lesson number one, which is the difference between growth and development. For context, we started 2022 at about 2.3 million in cash, okay, monthly cash. We ended at about 3.1, which isn't bad. That's 31% growth. So by any means, that's actually pretty good for a company. But for context, the year before, we were doing about 500 grand a month in January of 2021 and ended at 2.5 million a month in November of 2022, right? I think December was a little bit lower than that. Essentially, we didn't get anywhere near that explosive growth that we got in 2021. Now I will say we did grow our profit by about 70%, which is a big part of the difference between growth and development, which you're going to see in a second. So what is growth and development? Okay. Growth is the increase of top line numbers going into a system. All right. Development is the efficiency of that system in which you're going to extract energy out of the environment. So an easy example is India has more growth than the United States, but it's not a developed country. Whereas the United States does not have the growth India has, but it's considered a developed country, right? That means it's going to extract energy out of the environment much, much more efficiently, which is why we have all these nice things and awesome experiences in the United States. While we didn't have as much growth last year, we had a tremendous amount of development. So Here's the development we had. Obviously, we increased profit by 70%. That's a huge part of development. The other thing is too, is one of our companies decreased client load by 50% while increasing profit by 50%. So basically, we made way more money with half the clients. That's because we became more efficient. We became more of a developed company. Hopefully that makes sense. We also increased almost every single client success metric. So NPS scores, time to value, testimonials, review count, referrals, upsell percentage, obviously our backend revenue. So our backend revenue of our programs grow tremendously, which made us way more profitable, way more efficient. We decreased refunds, decreased chargeback, we decreased team churn. So we retained team members on average or, uh, on average or longer. And we increased the NPS scores of our team. So our team was more satisfied. They stayed longer. We finished the year with record closing percentages of our sales team. We decreased one of our company's CPAs by roughly 10 X. So as you can imagine, that made us wildly more profitable and wildly more efficient. And we increased the amount of book calls through lead nurture, which is essentially email, setters, target retargeting, display, and more. Okay. So the big lesson of this is our industry, especially the info industry, it's very obsessed with top line growth, which is great. You know, there's a period of time where I think you should be obsessed with what the top line is. But at a certain point, over focus on that can become actually counterproductive and toxic. It can become something to where you can grow and actually keep growing with very incremental levels of profit which means you're adding all this complexity for nothing. And a lot of times at the expense of your own sanity, your own stress, and also expense of your clients because you're taking on more clients that you can't handle. Ask yourself going into 2023, can we become more efficient with what we're already doing? Because I would rather keep it the same top line and double profit than double top line and only get a 50% increase in profit. Does it make sense? Also, kind of counterintuitively, prime us to really increase our top line next year. Like our goal next year is to crack 5 million a month between both of our companies. The second lesson I've had is the importance of partners. So coming into 2022, I basically owned 100% of all my companies. So I was in a place where I had a scarcity mentality, I was a control freak. I wouldn't admit I was a control freak, but it definitely was. I believed I could do everything myself. And to be honest, like giving, I don't know where this came from, but giving away a piece of my company felt like giving away a piece of myself. And basically it's like, was like stabbing myself in the heart. So now very, very uh, different by the end of this year, I have about five partners that have percentages in my company. And probably by next year, mid next year, I'll probably have seven to 10. And this is not just in one company, this is among various different companies. And this has been a game changer, okay? So here's five reasons why you need partners to get big. First of all, it's having people to rely on. You know, Robert Kiyosaki talks about in his books, if you can't leave your company for six months and there be an increase in revenue or at least a maintenance of revenue and improve as a company, then you don't have a real company. Now, I don't plan on leaving my company for six months, okay? I don't want to, I like working. However, I really do feel like I'm in a place now where I can definitely leave for an extended period of time and our companies would likely even grow without me. And because of this shift, it was the first time I was able to really take time off and take a step back and think about the next five to 10 years of our company and really have the bandwidth and the open space to really think about that vision. The other thing about partners is they help you drive growth. Okay. So having partners can really take the pressure off when you're all by yourself. Basically the growth of your company is constrained by your energy. Because if you're the only one who's going to get the upside of the top line or upside of the profit, yes, you have people trying to grow in your company and trying to grow and get their bonuses or whatever, but you don't really have the, it's just not the same 
energy compared to if you have five people viewing themselves as owners and really trying to grow the bottom line of the company. So when you have partners, essentially, you don't have to do it all yourself, okay? And this is absolutely huge. I can't tell you how many times where there'd be times where I wouldn't really be thinking about growing a certain particular division or a certain part of the company, but because of one of my partners, they were able to do that without me. There was also a point, and this really drives this home, there was a point where we had to restructure one of our companies. It took about three, four months of my time, and it was my sole focus. And during that time, one of our companies, the other company, doubled. Not just in top line, but also in profit. Literally doubled. And that was without me putting a lot of my direct focus on it because my direct focus was going towards the restructure of one of my companies. Another big thing about partners is allow you to diversify. So I was always really, really, really big on focus. And, you know, I do think that focus, especially as an entrepreneur in the beginning, is key in getting to a million a month. If you're not at a million a month, I don't think you should be doing anything other than one company. And to be honest, I think you should really try to stay with one company as long as you can. But there's a certain point where it does make sense to start expanding, whether that's new offers that are within the same company, new profit divisions, or just new companies in general. And the only way you can balance still being focused with having that diversification and actually starting to build a portfolio is to bring in partners to where the partner becomes the sole thing of that new opportunity. Right? And this is also how, if you have a vision that's big enough, the partners can fit their vision inside of your vision and make their profit center the sole focus of what they're doing. So that is huge as well. And it allows you to get big. And really at any company, this is how they get big. They basically take on a lot of partners. There's a lot of managing partners or GPs or whatever. Essentially, that's what allows all these different profit centers to grow independently and for them to get big. You know, one of the things that you study Agora Financial, they earn about $100 billion a year. They broke apart their companies into like seven or eight different profit divisions with all these different CEOs. And that took them from $100 billion a year to $1.5 billion a year. So a big part was having profit centers and CEOs who are driven on just increasing those, okay? Another thing is having partners is more fun. And this is maybe one of the biggest things, but I believe the two most important things you do in your life is the work that you do and the people that you do it with. And if you have great partners that you love and that you love working with, it makes work and showing up to work tremendously more fun combined with not having all the pressure on yourself. The final thing is partners open you up to blind spots. Really, as a leader and entrepreneur, it becomes harder and harder and harder for people to essentially understand what their own blind spots and their own weaknesses are, especially if you have a team of yes men. If you have a team where nobody has the spine to be able to stand up to you and give you feedback upwards, how are you ever going to grow as a partner, you know, as an entrepreneur yourself? When you work with partners and people who can view you as an equal, not only do they feel incentivized to give you the right feedback, but at the same time, also it's hard to get feedback without this, that person knowing you very closely. And so this gives you the opportunity for somebody to know you at a deep level and know really how you work but also incentivized to actually give you the feedback that you probably need. The next lesson, lesson number three, is why cash flow is critical to building a team. So one of the most common questions I've always gotten is how have I built such a great team? And I don't want to toot my own horn, but I do believe we do have the best team in the industry by far. Um, I've consulted over a thousand people at this point and some of the biggest names in the industry. I've never found a team pound for pound that really is as good as us in terms of mission, vision, and values, and just culture, and also the talent on the team. Doesn't mean we're doing the most revenue, but I will say, like, I wouldn't trade my team for any other team in the industry. And I mean that wholeheartedly. It's not just me backing my team there. Like, truthfully, I've never found a team that is as good as ours. And I've tried to reverse engineer of why I've been able to create this and I get a ton of questions about it. And if I look at how I started my company, I think this is a big part of it. And it's not the sole reason, but it's a big part. So when I started back in 2019, I was doing everything. I was doing all the social media posting, which is generating the leads. I was doing all the setting. I was doing all the closing. I was doing all the filming. I was doing all the upsells, everything. Okay. And then on top of that, I was highly proficient in all of those things. So I was good at the marketing. I could generate a lot of leads. I was good at the setting. I could do a lot of the setting. I was closing 50 to 80% of calls. I was upselling 50% of clients into our upsell by myself. I was doing all the fulfillment and our price points on front end and back end were like at a 50 to 100% premium of our top competitor in the market. So I was doing it at a high level and charging way more money. So what happened was this allowed me to generate like 90% profit margin at 150 to 200 grand a month, which set me up to have the margin and the cash flow to be able to hire great people from the start. And when I took on these three or four great people from the start, what they were able to do is they became the one person who hired the next 10 or 20 people. So this set my company up for the initial conditions for a really, really phenomenal and great team. Now there's obviously other parts of it. There's having good culture, there's having good values, there's having good mission, all of that stuff. But this was so, so key. And if you think about it, this is why a lot of companies raise capital, right? They do a huge series uh, raise of capital to be able to have this big vision, attract all these great people, 
so that they can build a team that's ultimately going to allow them to scale. But if you have a service-based company or an education-based company like mine, you're not going to do that, right? You're probably not going to raise capital. Another big lesson I had this year was having fun. Back half of the year, especially, was when I really experienced this. And prior to really this, I guess you can call it realization or just this emphasis on having more fun in our company and having more fun in general in my life, I just was all about work. I was all about sacrificing the present moment for a better future, which I do think is tremendously a positive skill set to have. You know, like, I mean, I'm not going to go over the marshmallow test, but you've probably heard of the marshmallow test where kids who could defy instant gratification were some of the most successful people when they tracked them 20 years down the line. Right. So I do think having that mindset is absolutely critical. However, this year I put a much bigger emphasis on smelling the roses and it's 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 not only made my life way more enjoyable, but at the same time, it's really actually provided a great ROI. So let me explain. So number one, one of the big reasons why I've actually put more of an emphasis on this is understanding that you, the utility of money not only goes down the more of you get of it, but also goes down as the older that you get. So for instance, a dollar today is gonna be worth way less to me when I'm 80 years old. That's not just because of inflation, obviously it's that, but even independent of that, the things I can do with money, trips, experiences, doing fun things, taking people out, all these things that I can do now, I'm not going to be able to do when I'm 80 years old. So number one, understanding the utility of money is going to go down. That doesn't mean blow all your money. I still live way, way below my means. But at the same time, I think it's important to actually enjoy a lot of the fruits of your labor. The next thing is, if I'm 80 years old, and this is one of the things, you know, I study Alex Ramosi and, and gotten this for him, and he does the 80-year-old test where he's 80 years old, and he looks, you know, through the grandfather frame, of kind of how he would make decisions if he, you know, if he was 80 and what his 80 year old self would tell him. And if I look back, if I'm 80, I'd probably look at this 30 year time where I'm making all of this money and having a great time and have a great company. It's probably one of the most nostalgic and twilight years of my life where I am not only, you know, have a great purpose. I'm not only on fire. I love working. I, you know, all of these things, but at the same time, I'm in a place where I'm really in, have the opportunity to experience life, travel, and ultimately have the most fun that I can. And I think that for me, what really hit home is when I think about my college years, you know, I spent all of my college basically getting, uh, you know, studying all the time, working super, super hard, making sure I always got 4.0s, like it was a highly perfectionist time of my life. And if I look back on college, I really just think, man, like if I regret one thing, it was just not having more fun. And I already had a lot of fun and I wish I just had more of it. And I think my time in my life right now is very, very similar. Like if I think of myself when I'm 80, even if I'm a billionaire, and I look back to today, I would wish that I had way more fun than I'm having now. And so this really shifted in the back half of the year. And it didn't only help me just enjoy life more, but it also helped me in work. So reason number three here is for a high performer like myself, I was talking to one of my coaches about this. I would find that the weekends or the times or the vacations where I'd have a ton of fun, you know, I'd be out late, I'd be, uh, you know, hanging out with my friends, I'd be traveling, having experiences, whatever. I'd find I'd come back from those trips or come back from those weekends way more rejuvenated than if I had just stayed at home and just rested, which was kind of weird because a lot of times I was lacking sleep. I wasn't, you know, focusing on my physical recovery. I wasn't journaling. I wasn't doing a lot of things that I really thought were good ways to recover. And what my coach helped me realize is that for a high performer like myself, and maybe you're the same way, I think it's really, really, really key and really, really big to be able to do something that just forces you not to think about work. Okay. Now let me be very clear. I'm not one of those people who thinks thinking about work is bad. I, you know, had people on, the, uh, on my team about this before who thought this way, just because you're thinking about work on a weekend or thinking about work on an evening, or you can't de-plug. I don't think that's a bad thing. I think that's a superpower, but at the same time, I think there's a ton of ROI that you can get in terms of rest and recovery from being in a place where you're actually not thinking about it. But I know for me, the only way I could do that is to be out there actually doing stuff in the present moment and having an experience. And then the other thing is as well, is these deeper states of presence have allowed me to become extremely more creative. And so for instance, a lot of this year, I was in a place where I knew how, our, how to get our companies to fight about five, six million a month. But beyond that, I was always saying to myself and repeating this mantra of like, I have no idea how to get past that. I have no idea how to get to a billion. I have no idea how to get the nine figures. I don't know what's gonna be the big opportunity. And when I really started focusing on more of this and kind of deep plugging, if you will, what happened was these ideas and these opportunities of which how we could get much bigger and how we could get to the point where we're a billion dollar company, they came very quickly and very naturally. And I think the reason for that is there's kind of two states of thinking. There's focus related thinking where you're focusing directly on the problem. And then there's also, I think it's called the fusion thinking where you're, you're relaxed and you're not directly focusing on the problem, 
but you're indirectly focusing on it, right? You probably heard that you want to go to sleep thinking about a problem. And a lot of times you wake up in the morning or you wake up in the middle of the night and you find the answer or you find the answer in the shower, for instance. So I think this was very, very much allowed me to do that to where when I was having experiences to have more fun and just really putting an emphasis on this, I was able to essentially, a lot of times these ideas would just come up completely out of nowhere. And a lot of times they would do it while I was traveling or do it while I was out. And uh, it's kind of a weird thing to think about, but it really did help me un actually expand our vision for our company, which is going to make us a lot of money next year. So the next big thing is I lost 40 pounds this year. So we'll put a photo on the screen of my transformation. I lost a tremendous amount of fat. I got way healthier. And in hindsight, I'm, uh, I'm very frustrated. I didn't do this earlier. And a big thing was I had this story that because I was this successful business owner and I was so busy and I had all the stress that I just needed food to be able to combat the stress and I wasn't going to be able to do it, which was a huge lie. So how I was able to drop all the weight is first of all, I obviously dropped the story. Second of all, I weighed myself every single day. So I get up every single morning, I wake up. The very first thing I do is I weigh myself on the same scale and I write down in an Excel sheet exactly what I weighed. This, that was the number one thing I did. And that is so, so key. When you measure stuff, it gets managed. And that is like the simplest thing that I think if anybody would do, they could probably lose weight just from that just from scale feedback regulation. The next thing was I stabilized my calorie intake. So I tracked exactly the amount of calories I was eating every single day, okay? Very, very simple. Um, then all I'd do is I'd lower the calories until I was losing about a pound and a half a week. And so what I would do is let's say I weighed 190 at the beginning of the week on a Saturday. I would make my goal by next Saturday to get under, what would that be? 188.5. Okay. So I'd almost make it the same way as like my sales projection as I'd say, you know, back when I was a sales rep, I'd say, okay, I'm going to hit five units this week or six units this week. I would just make that my goal. And what I would do is I would just adjust my intake slowly down to where I was below that before Saturday. And if I got too below it, I would adjust my intake a little bit up. Okay. And I would try to just maintain. So I cruised right into Saturday at a pound and a half over or pound and a half under, and then I would decrease the next week. That was literally it. Okay. Only other few things I would say about this and, and, and some things that helped me lose the weight is I tried to eat about uh, 120 to 150 gram protein per day, which is a little below. I mean, I'm 167 right now, so that's a little bit below my body weight. I found that was totally fine to keep all of my strength and all my muscle as I was cutting. So I eat about 120 to 150 uh, grams of protein a day, but I was pretty flexible with that. I allow myself to eat whatever I wanted. So this is very, very key. There's a lot, I'm not, you know, a health professor, health scientist, researcher, whatever, but there's a lot of research that goes towards the fact that if you name a food as bad or off limits, that you actually crave that food more. So I'd actually very quickly, if I found myself wanting chicken wings or cinnamon rolls or whatever, dessert, alcohol, I'd make sure I had it. And the more quickly you actually include the thing you're craving into your diet and into your routine, the less powerful that craving becomes. And even the thought that you can have that if you want, that it's not off limits, even that helps you have less craving for it. It's kind of a, a weird thing that works like that. And so I would still obviously hit my calorie projections. I would still obviously focus on hitting my weight projections, but I really let myself eat whatever I wanted to. And another thing is as well, is I didn't try to only hit my calories each day. Like for instance, one day I might eat twice the amount of calories than I was supposed to eat, which we obviously a pretty big day of eating. I didn't let that like throw me off. Still technically in my mind, I was on my diet. All I had to do was just adjust my intake a little bit lower in the subsequent days to still hit my weight projection, which funny enough, a lot of times when I would go way off and have this huge dinner, three course meal and all these desserts, if I just adjust my intake the next day, increase my activity a little bit, and then maybe the day after adjust my intake a little bit more to where I wasn't actually the calorie target I wanted to be, but a little bit more, I'd actually end up losing weight and really breaking through a weight plateau that I hadn't broken through yet. So that was really big. The other thing I did is I would intermittent fast and I would eat the majority of my calories at 4 p.m. and 7 p.m. So I wouldn't eat anything all day. Maybe at lunch I'd have like 200 grams or 300 grams, of, or sorry, not grams, 200 or 300 calories of protein, that was it. And then at 4 p.m. I'd have a huge feast and at 7 p.m. I'd have like a healthy dessert. And I found that combination of first the huge feast and also the healthy dessert allowed me to go to bed satisfied every single day, which I found for me, I don't mind being a little bit hungry when I'm working or recording a video like this, but at night, it's very, very tough for me to stave off the cravings and to go to bed not full. Doing this, there's nothing that I believe is advan like there's nothing that gives you an advantage in terms of fasting. It's only that fasting allowed me a way of eating 
to where I felt like I could stay in a caloric deficit every single day. And if you study a lot of the researchers out there, like Lane Norton's a great guy, Jeff Nippert's great, um, Alan Aragon's great, Brett Catrese is great, Lyle McDonald. You know, I've worked worked with Greg Gallagher personally. It's not about you know fasting or low carb, high carb, or whatever. It's just about whatever way of eating that you feel like you can adhere to, not just for the diet, but also for a lifetime. And you know, after losing this weight, I would say the biggest difference between how I lost it this time versus other times, because I lost it and gained it back. This time, I truly feel like the way I'm eating, I could do it forever, easily. And it's really just following this stuff and keeping it very, very simple. So the next lesson I had was the power of organic traffic. So this year I've seen people like Alex Ramosi, Iman Ghazi, obviously Andrew Tate, a lot of folks blow up on social media. And at the same time, I've looked at my clients, I've had over a thousand clients now, and the ones that have the easiest pass to a million a month, if not more, and the most profitable pass there are also folks that have big organic followings. Like I've seen people with, you know, over a million YouTube subs or over a million Instagram followers get to a million a month. And to be honest, they're just not that good. You know, they're obviously great at organic, but in terms of their sales team and their product and their client success, they're just not that good of businesses, but they have a really, really great audience. A few things I noticed about this, and some of these first things are obvious, some of the next things are not as obvious, is that the ability to get traffic is obviously much easier if you have an organic following. And there's also no complexity of having to run ads. There's also no worries about getting banned or compliance. It's just much, much easier. It's obviously much, much more profitable, and it's much cheaper. Like for instance, Alex Ramosi talks about how spending 70K a month on his organic uh, team and you know all the video production and all that stuff allows him to get the same amount of impressions that he was he was getting when he was or not he was getting but that he would have to get if he spent two million a month on ads so he's getting the same amount of impressions for 70k a month that he's getting spending two million a month on ads right that's insane so it's much much cheaper but here's what's even the craziest part what i've noticed is that this traffic and i've noticed it through, through my clients not necessarily through my own personal experience but or i shouldn't say that because we've had people reach out for my own uh organic or youtube channel or videos like this or whatever and they come into one of our programs and they do fit this bill but with my clients that are mainly just organic what i've noticed is their traffic obviously converts at a much higher rate it's warmer done they also their traffic becomes better customers who gets better results and are more easily satisfied so the traffic itself from organic is actually easier better it's really your best customers who are much easier satisfied, they get better results, and they upsell at a higher rate and they have more higher retention. So here's why I think this is. My company is very direct response based. So we run ads and we obviously run ads to a sales video and a sales call, all that stuff. So we feel like we're convincing people on every stage. We have to convince them when they watch the ad. We have to convince them when they look at our sales video. We have to convince them on the sales call. We have to convince them when they're on the onboarding call. It's like every single step of the way, we have to convince them of our value. It's a very push-based marketing. Whereas organic is a very pull-based marketing. And what I think is people follow you on social media or YouTube or whatever, they get to know, like, and trust you. And they kind of come to the decision in their own mind that they're going to work with you before they even reach out and speak with your sales team. And then when they get on the inside, they're much easily, much more easier satisfied because for them, they have came to the conclusion themselves. So in order for them to realize and believe that they made a bad decision and the product's not good, they also have to admit to themselves they made a stupid decision, which is very, very different from more of a direct response approach with what we're doing, where we're making guarantees and we're putting our, you know, we're not doing anything ethical, but we're very uh, direct response based and very push based opposed to pull based, if that makes sense. So with organic, opposed to constantly convincing people of your value, they're actually convincing themselves. And it really leverages the uh, principle Robert Cialdini talks about in influence, which is the consistency bias, which people want to appear consistent. And in order for them to be able to admit to themselves they made a bad decision, they also have to admit to themselves that they're inconsistent with their decision making. So a big, big thing I've noticed is just your clients are better, your retention is better, your client, your, your satisfaction is better, your, your company is so much more easier to run and less stressful, all if you have organic traffic. It's truly the initial conditions that sets everything else after that. So Obviously, I'm not going to be able to replace all of our paid media overnight, but our goal by 2025, and I don't care if it takes till 20, you know, 2030, but eventually our goal is to replace all of our ads traffic through organic. And I think if you have a high ticket business, you should be doing the same. The next thing is investing. So in 2021, I got rid of money as qu quickly as I made it, right? We were in a high inflationary environment. Everything was going up. It was like you were shamed if you held cash, which I totally uh, regret feeling that way. 
and really, really wish I could just go back to myself a year ago and tell myself to chill the F out. And so I would invest in funds and crypto and private equity and all this other bullshit. And not that any of it was bad investments, but do I really look back on that and view that any of it was a great, great use of my capital? No. And the thing that was even worse about it is it was a huge distraction of my time. And I would spend all this time researching funds or real estate properties and all this stuff that ultimately I should have just spent on my companies. And so this year, especially after the market crash, one of the things I'm really focusing on is only focusing my capital in things that I have active participation. And then other than that, I'm just going to focus on my companies. So essentially what I have is I have an offshore trust. It's in uh, the Cook Islands. And then in that offshore trust, all my money is held by a Swiss bank. And then in that Swiss bank, we either add liquidity to the international markets, which uh, basically, I don't know exactly how this works, but basically uh, we add liquidity to the euro, to the US exchange. You get about 3% of doing that. We do treasury bills and we do S&P 500. So all my capital is going to be parked in those assets, which are high, obviously very liquid. And at the same time, we're going to probably have boring 3 to 4% a year, okay? Uh, probably like 2 to 4% on the low end and S&P 500, 7% a year. So very, very, very boring stuff. And I'm going to hold it in cash. Then I'm just going to keep that on the sidelines for anything where I have active participation in, okay? And especially where I can seize market opportunities, which I think are going to be here in the next two to three years. So it doesn't mean I'm not going to make investments, but they have to be investments in which I really believe I have a true advantage, like investments of my, my companies or my intentions at, all of that stuff. And other than that, I'm just not going to do anything with it. And to be honest, I would be happy if I didn't invest anything except for that four to 5%, you know, and, and just, and, just, and continue to increase the cash flow with our companies. The last and final thing is healing the past. So this is the first year really committed to working with a world-class coach and hypnotherapist who's really helped me level up in relationships, work, life, happiness, all of this stuff. And I originally started with this coach just to make money and just try to, you know, make more money and have more success and all these things. And it took about six to seven months, but we finally started digging into a lot of childhood stuff that I really didn't realize at the time was having such a big impact on me. So for context, one of the things about this is I noticed a lot of the memories in which we had to dig into were some of the most, they seemed like random memories of, uh, you know, stuff with my parents and just different stuff of my childhood. They seemed like random memories, but they're, they were memories that would come up often, like, you know, not necessarily once a week, but maybe once every couple of weeks. And they seem random and unrelated. And also they'd be some of my most prominent memories from high school or some of my most earliest prominent memories from childhood. And I think those are big indicators of the exact stuff that we need to work on. And as we started to work on this, I became so much more empathetic. I feel like I live life um, so much more with a lighter energy opposed to this like clench fist, succeed or die <laughs> type of energy. And uh, also I become a much better public speaker. Like the last speech I gave, a lot of my team was there and they were like, man, I've just never seen you speak that well and speak that naturally. And a lot of that was because of the work I did. I've cultivated much better, deeper relationships. I've had more fun, like I've said earlier. And it's really uh, been one of the most profound things I've done, um, you know, up until this point in my life. So I recommend if you're working with a therapist, number one, make sure they're really, really good. Like this person is extremely expensive and uh, just extremely, extremely uh, profound and, and, and phenomenal what this person does. So uh, number one, work with somebody really good. And number two, man, you got to dig into those memories that are frequent or some of the most random earliest memories that you've seen. Those, that's what I really found was the biggest ROI for me. So hopefully this was helpful to you. That's it for this video, guys. And we'll see you in 2023.